مرحبا دكتور أيها الأصدقاء سأخير يقول المقدسي محمد الكرد أن جدته المسنة لا تتذكره إلا أنها ما زالت تتذكر ما فعلته بعائلتها الميليشيات الصهيونية عام 1922 ويضيف يدل ذلك على استمرار المكتب إنها تسكن فينا لا يختلف إثنان أن تجدد النكبة أعني به أولا مواصلة الاختصاب والتهجير والاستيطان يعيدنا إلى البداية وإلى اكتشاف بعض ما احتجب عن الأعين وراء التراجعات والهزائم والأوهام والخيبات لكننا نسمع جيل الأحفاد والحفيدات يستعيد اليوم قصة النكبة ويرويها بلغة جديدة ويقبض على جمرها ويصنع مقاومته بنفسه وعينه مشدودة إلى ما هو أبقى رغم ما شاعت تسميته انسداد الأفق السياسي في كتابيه معنى النكبة ومعنى النكبة مجددا يشدد قسطنطين زرايق على أولية التعامل مع ضياع فلسطين بوصفه نكبة عربية حيث الهزيمة ليست عسكرية وسياسية فحسب بل ثقافية أيضا ولم يكن مردها بنظر زريق تفوق قوم على قوم بل تميز نظام على نظام وهذا ما دفعه إلى القول بنوع من القطيعة مع الماضي وإلى توسل العقلانية والحرية في العمل من أجل وحدة العرب وتعزيز انشغالهم بأسئلة النهوض والتقدم وكان العرب بمن فيهم الفلسطينيون ومنذ أيام النكبة الأولى ينظرون إلى قضية فلسطين بوصفها قضية عربية ولم يغيروا في هذا الإدراك بل حفره عميقا شعور فئة من الفلسطينيين وهي واسعة أنهم ضحية مزدوجة لصعود المشروع الصهيوني وللوهن العربي بصوره العديدة ومنها الخذلان والتخلف ورغم ذلك بل بسببه بدا للكثيرين أن نظام العربية التحررية والوحدوي هو باب النظام الفلسطيني ومحرابه تغير الأمر وإن بقدر منذ انطلاق حركة المقاومة الفلسطينية المسلحة عرفت أخذا وردا لم ينخطعا بين من رأى فيها بمثابة رافعة للثورات العربية وبين من شدد على فلسطينية المشروع التحرري الفلسطيني كما ظهر تباين صريح بين القائلين بالتضامن الفلسطيني مع قوى التغيير في البلدان العربية وبين المتحفظين أحيانا تدخل في شؤون الدول الشقيقة ومراعاة بعض الأنظمة سعيا وراء دعمها وفي بعض الحالات كما في لبنان شهدنا عوض التباين اختلاطا في المواقف وازدواجا ولعشر سنين خلت أي عند قيام الثورات العربية جنح البعض إلى الجزم بأن قوى التغيير في البلدان العربية لم تعد تحمل الهم القومي ولم تعد تنظر إلى قضية فلسطين بوصفها القضية القومية الأولى وأنها 
باتت مستغرقه في شوارعها الوطنيه ومن جهه ثانيه استعجل البعض بخفه وتعميم التاكيد ان فئه واسعه من الفلسطينيين لم تتفاعل مع الثورات العربيه وان مواقفها من الانظمه الاستبداديه ومن القوى المؤيده لها revolutions that took place in the arab region and some regimes expressed their declared hatred to israel irrespective of the practices of those countries against their people and despite the facts that these resorted to such thinking the palestinian cause remained alive in many within many forces particularly in the areas where the revolutions have erupted and the testament to that is the different opinion polls that have been carried out on an annual basis and we have seen different positions palestinian positions that were concerned about what was happening in those countries and they never turned a blind eye to the victims of arab regime authoritarianism and today in the age of counter revolutions in dismantlement age uh, and in the age of normalization of relations from the part of some arab countries with israel it has become apparent to us and as a result of the renewed uh, palestinian strife against the apartheid practiced by israel and uh, it has become clear that the Palestinian cause is still alive in our Arab consciousness. And it is not victim to these sterile dichotomies that have been manifested in the last 10 years. And this leads us to more contemplation, to more dialogue in the Palestinian cause in the Arab region and to shine light on the linkage between our faith and uh, the need for solidarity, mutual solidarity. So Dr. Azmi Bshara is the best to urge us in order to contemplate in this matter. He is the best to talk about this issue. I do not need perhaps to introduce him and talk about his intellectual contemplations and his political and unique political experiences. These are all known to you. So he's been working on many levels, political, ethical, working between his commitment for the rights of Palestinians, the dignity and liberty of Palestinians, and also in defense of the rights of Arab peoples, their rights and their dignity. I would like to thank you for being with us on behalf of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and on behalf of the Palestinian Studies Unit. I would like to invite Dr. Azmi Bshara to talk about the contemporary relevance of the Nakba and on the Arab dimension. Go ahead, sir. Dr. Tarek for this presentation and introduction. And I agree with your analysis and I uh, thank you for uh, the idea and I thank the Palestinian uh, uh, and it's, it's difficult to talk about Nakba without talking about uh, 
the current uh, uh, issues because our followers on the social media would expect us to, and I don't want to leave that to the end of this uh, intervention. I would like to move straight to what's been happening in Palestine and as uh, Dr. Tark knows we chose the topic before the current uh, escalation, but uh, the current uh, affairs and what's happening in fact confirms our choice of topic and it's at the heart of the colonial settlement. Uh, by that we mean the expulsion of people and the usurping their lands and settling on them. And this was uh, the reason why uh, the latest uh, intifada has taken place and the uh, solidarity, the wide-ranging solidarity with them. In fact, the Nakba project is still true to its basics by usurping uh, land and uh, although the majority of Jews is quite well established now in uh, 48 uh, uh, lands and Israel is an industrialized state, uh, but there is something which is at the heart of their political culture, which makes them, make them uh, uh, embers uh, settler communities and the same goes to the Galili and Negev to uh, uh, the idea of replacing uh, the Arab population by Jewish settlers, especially in areas where their strategic planners attach importance to as far as the current situation is concerned, and referring back to the introduction by my friend Dr. Tarek's introduction, I cannot get rid of a feeling or an impression. I did not have much time to contemplate or write about, and that is the similarity between what happened in East Jerusalem and on the West Bank and later on in the Palestinian diaspora, if we can use this term. And that with the beginnings of the Arab Spring and the Arab revolutions, which were due to the long-standing feeling of disappointment and the Islamist uh, movement's uh, involvement with the Arab Spring and Arab revolutions that took weeks. Uh, what happened in Palestine took days, but there are similarities, uh, however, which the Palestinians do not differ that much than the larger Arab context. Uh, and how can we therefore understand what's happening now in Palestine if we do not look at it through the lens of long-term disappointment, Israeli settlement, uh, uh, to almost total disregard by the international uh, community, what Trump has done by moving uh, his embassy to Jerusalem and uh, practically recognizing Jerusalem as capital and giving the Israelis a green light to settle because uh, uh, they did not consider that illegal according to Trump's Secretary of State at the time. Also, uh, last but not least, 
the violations in the Masjid al-Aqsa Mosque and really this hurt people a lot. The Israelis are trying to make the world get used to the idea that the Al-Aqsa Mosque is a shared place of worship and eventually it will be shared by Muslims and Jews. And in my opinion, and this is uh, something I've been believing for a long time. Every time the Jewish settlers uh, came to the Aqsa Mosque on special days of celebration for the Jews was uh, a prelude to ultimately sharing the Aqsa Mosque between the two communities, similarly to what happened to the Abrahamic Mosque. And by that, uh, eventually expelling and evicting people and replacing them with settlers. This has uh, led to uh, even the feeling of triumphalism, which we see now about uh, Hamas and other resistance movements uh, getting involved there is that represents something of an act of avenging the violated dignity of the Palestinian and Muslim people. And we see all this euphoria that we see, even some politicians are taking part of this is just a matter of spontaneous feelings and reactions, but we are not here uh delving deeply into discussing who achieved victory or not this is not uh, the foundation here the basic feeling amongst people is there is someone now who stood up to israelis pushed back and responded to them and all this talk we hear about teaching the israelis a lesson and making them pay a price for a fourth or fifth generation Arab after the Nakba is something they want. They want this for their dignity, to restore their dignity, their humanity. And that by that feeling, I mean, there is someone amongst the Palestinians who can push back, who can respond, who can make the other side uh, have a taste of their own medicine by feeling the suffering they've been uh, really administering to others and forcing on others. These aspects have not been discussed uh, deeply enough, I think. As for what has happened, I will need only a few minutes to explain what I think. Uh, I don't want uh, the time uh, to uh, pass quickly and without uh, discussing the ideas we came here to discuss. After the few very difficult and hard days, this is in the sense that uh, people uh, in the Gaza Strip and their suffering, which ended, however, with this feeling of pride and responding to to Israel's F-15s and F-16s and F-35s with the weapon of the poor, the, the rockets, the, they, they are firing from behind the, the siege lands they've been forced to live in, responding to this aggressor. To a certain extent, this has created a change. And ev uh, there is something that uh, everybody noticed, but not many gave it enough time to think about and contemplate, and I can't claim to do that now. Uh, Israel uh, relied on the division of 1947 of the Palestinian homeland, and uh, it had reunified Palestine in 1966 on the basis of uh, a relative justice or international leg legitimacy. Uh, practically speaking, Israel has, uh, Palestine, sorry, has been unified under the authority of Israel since 1967. 
we saw in this intifada a new reaction at various levels, but the Palestinian people in all their parts where they exist, they managed to communicate and interact, and we can discuss later whether or not this will, uh, how this will impact the Israel, the Arab Israelis, the, the Arab living inside Israel. I'll focus on the Gaza Strip, however, because everybody started saying that Gaza has become an Islamic mini state or Islamic emirate and all what thereafter is they want to cling to their own power and nobody cared anymore about Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. Now the people who rule the Gaza Strip have reconstituted uh, Jerusalem as their cause too. And this is very important because before that there was a very serious political and geographic divide and schism. Uh, the Palestinian people under the British mandate were unified and the, it developed its national identity since the third national conference until 1948. After 1948, there was this uh, uh, disentanglement and division and then the PLO was formed and they reconstituted or unified the, the Palestinian cause. After what happened in Gaza and Hamas taking over of Gaza, a real schism has come into existence because they had their own ministries, they even had their own ideologies and identities and because ideologies create identities ultimately. So therefore, uh, reunifying re re Gaza with the West Bank was very important. And this is important, of course, because it revealed the Palestinian people's ability to resist. Many were surprised. I was not. I've been following events. I know because people under siege for this a long time, very long time. Only 2011 to 2010, during the Egyptian revolution, they had a breather and Gaza was opened up to the rest of the world. But apart from that, and in, under all circumstances, what they managed to build as by way of fortifications, building weapons, and the ability to reach all parts of Palestine with their rockets. This is a big achievement. Nonetheless, it's a big breakthrough. And Israel until now may not realize this, but this will change the balance of deterrence. What happened in Gaza was uh, deterrence which uh, faced deterrence. We don't know how the results will be in the future and how uh, uh, Hamas and other resistance movements in, uh, in Gaza have expanded the concept of defending Gaza to defending Al-Aqsa to Israel has responded with the brutal, merciless uh, bombardment. They annihilated entire families uh, to say that the price for Hamas's deterrence will be this, this destruction. And if you ever think again of that, this is what you have to prepare yourselves for and brace yourselves for. Of course, ultimately, international forces, including the United States, initiated their contacts, their um, diplomatic contacts. And of course, the main aspect of this is the fact that the Democratic Party is in, the, in power. If Trump was still in power and this war lasted 100 days, nothing would have happened. Egypt couldn't have interfered and Israel 
could have had its way with Hamas and that did what did to them. The Egyptian role without the Democratic Party's role couldn't have achieved much. This was a very important aspect of this latest round of conflict. Now, the Israelis, since Sharon 2005, deal with the Gaza Strip in a very strange manner. They consider Gaza as a place they occupied in, in 1967 and they disengaged from in 2005. So they say, what more do you want from us? We withdrew from Gaza and Hamas is attacking us. We withdrew from Lebanon, we had Hezbollah attacking us. And if we withdraw from the West Bank, they will attack us from the West Bank. In fact, Gaza is not an occupied uh, land. Gaza is a huge refugee camp. You cannot understand Gaza in 1967, even the entire Palestine, you cannot understand that way. And what when Palestine was divided into 67 borders by some parts of the PLO in 1974 by the so-called 10-point program, and practically speaking, that was another state. This led to the conclusion that if Israel withdrew from the 67 areas, the whole issue will be over. The population of Gaza, 95% of the population of Gaza are refugees from areas from southern Palestine, from uh, Yaffa downwards. The people from Yaffa uh, uh, left their lands after they were expelled, either by sea or they went to Gaza. So Gaza is a huge uh, refugee camp which has not been dealt with. Then it was put under siege, which is still going on until this moment in time. I was I prepared something for you. I translated. It is a quote by Moshe Dayan. It's from a book by Moshe Dayan. Uh, Moshe Dayan. Uh, attended a eulogy in the Hal Oz settlement and he delivered a speech. I can't see the, the screen clearly. I don't know if you can see it. I think this represented the first generation of settlers, of Moshe Dayan's generation. Uh, uh, in the eulogy, I cannot see it any longer. I don't know where it is. Says early yesterday morning, Roy was murdered. Let's not cast the blame on the murderous murders today. Why should we declare their burning hatred for us? Uh, this is for eight years they have been sitting in the refugee camps in Gaza. This is before 67. And before their eyes, we have been transforming the lands and the villages where they and their fathers dwelt into our state. It's not among the Arabs in Gaza. We are not going to 
uh, ask uh, uh, Arabs for the blood of Ru'i, uh, how did we shut our eyes and refuse to look squarely at our fate and see in all its brutality the destiny of our generation? Have we forgotten that this group of young people dwelling at Nahal Oz is bearing the heavy gates of Gaza on its uh, uh, on its shoulders, we will make our reckoning with ourselves today. We are the generation that settles the land and without the steel helmet and the cannons, more, we will not be able to plant a tree or build a home. I think Moshe Dayan is not summarizing Gaza's case. He is only summarizing the, set, the colonial settlement which thrives on weapons. They know what they did. They know who, is, who surrounds them. And this is even more accurate than Kinsky's uh, uh, article who said that people, the people are, the Arabs are nationalist people that can never accept us. So therefore, they speak about uh, Gaza after they withdrew from it in 2005. Now I move to the question of uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem uh, represents a lot of symbolism, of course. It was annexed and uh, uh, occupied. And we know the details. We know about how the borders were expanded and as long as they considered part of Jerusalem to be sacred according to the biblical discourse and they projected that onto the modern times, this is relatively understandable. But now, anywhere they call part of Jerusalem have expanded into considering it a sacred place and holy place for them. On the 30th, 30th of, uh, of July, they called uh, Israel, they called Jerusalem the permanent and complete and unified eternal capital of Israel. In 1993, the municipality was further expanded to 130 square kilometers. In 2005, the government established plans for Jerusalem until 2020. The language they use and the discourse they use in the media, they use relatively an a normal uh, language, but when they sit amongst themselves in their meetings, they use the language of uh, apartheid, it's Judaization. They start saying that, uh, they start uh, saying that uh, the percentage or the number of the population should be uh, the, or for Jews should be so and so and for the Arabs to be so and so and what steps should be taken to enforce that. Of course, building settlements uh, around Jerusalem, this is a corpus separatum of Jerusalem of 1947. And also the expansion of Jewish uh, settlements in the old city from 1967 to 23. And, uh, and I, I put it under the title of expansion of Jewish settlers in the old city. First, they uh, usurped the so-called Jewish district. And then they started taking over different uh, uh, parts of uh, the old city through settler companies, through the claims of absent, the absentees, absentee owners, etc. Uh, sometimes they dig up uh, uh, the name of a grandson from the fourth generation in the United States to use it to claim land in Jerusalem. Then there was a settlement ring around the old city of Jerusalem. 
you see the areas shaded in blue, the all settlements until 2019, there were about 12 settlements. But uh, uh, the, you see Jerusalem is being surrounded by settlements to isolate it from uh, Ramallah and the road to Jericho to, to, to turn it into an Arab district within a Jewish city. This is what we see in the Sheikh Jarrah district, Wadi al Jews and others. Uh, the next plan will be this. Uh, usurping uh, air lands in Selwan district surrounding uh, uh, the, uh, the gates of the old city. Also uh, taking over uh, houses in the Sheikh Jarrah and also uh, surrounding. I'll try and finish in a few minutes. Something important happened in the latest uh, events. The plan by the Zionist movement and the Israeli government, I, I sat in the Knesset for 12 years and I dealt with the issue of Palestine and Jerusalem on a daily basis and I used to see how the, the Arab Jerusalem was turned into slums and you know you know what happens in slums like this and what features of life I'm not going to go into the many negative aspects of that they stood up to the generation the, to the occupation there is a new generation now from this point of view the AXA plays an important rallying role for the Palestinian youth. To say that the question is not a religious dispute and Jerusalem is a question of sovereignty. When uh, Yasser Arafat was, was offered sovereignty over Jerusalem uh, without uh, Al-Aqsa, he did not accept that. Without sovereignty over Jerusalem, uh, uh, Yasser Arafat refused. And everybody who followed what was happened in, in uh, Sheikh Jarrah will immediately notice that these young people, similar to the generation of the Arab Spring, they could have turned this these uh, districts into ghettos into uh, fertile grounds for drug taking and other abuses like slums can be turned into. But now, on the contrary, they are acting as a rallying point for Palestinian nationalism and protecting the Aqsa. Now I would like to speak about the Arab uh, dimension that my friend Dr. Uh, Tarek uh, has uh, alluded to. So, and the transformation into a new term that we did not hear before and that is being repeated in the media talking about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which is a term that did not exist in the past, was not known in the past. There is a Palestinian-Israeli conflict and not a Palestinian cause, which is the first cause that Arabs are uh, concerned with. So it seems that this process did not prevail at the level of the Arab street, at least the Arab street. The beginnings uh, of the main cause of the Arabs, and this is what I believe, I think it started during the nationalist current. There were first, second and third causes. Arabs are a nation with a first cause uh, so we're going to talk after that uh, to the behavior of Arabs during the Nakba and uh, the uh, behavior which is similar to the behavior that we have now the contemporary relevance of such kind of behavior 
and do not think that the first cause of Arabs, when we talk about it, I do not think that it means that when I discuss this matter with the, uh, a Syrian who is subjected to the to injustices, it doesn't mean that uh, Palestine is his first cause. Uh, I cannot impose on the Egyptian who is subjected to injustices and tell him that your first cause is the Palestinian cause or the Iraqi young men. We have hundreds of Iraqi men and women that have been uh, uh, killed, uh, so they had been uh, without arms, armless, uh, as a result of these confrontations with the uh, militias. So the first Arab cause, if we are one ummah, one nation, as Arabs and not as Syrians, Lebanese, Iraqis, and so on and so forth, because the first cause of uh, uh, the Syrian is uh, the dictatorship and authoritarianism. The first cause of the Iraqis is the system that they have. But uh, when we talk about the cause that we all have as Arabs is the Palestinian cause. Our first cause as Arabs is the Palestinian cause. Uh, if we talk about an Arab ummah, an Arab nation, this is nation, this is our first cause. And this is how we understand the Palestinian cause. So when there is a dismantlement in the Arabic ummah or the Arab identity, we see a retreat in terms of the position of the Arab cause. So I think that the Palestinian cause is the first cause of all Arabs. And uh, uh, the way Arabs feel as Arabs is linked to this cause. So, so when we had the peace conventions and agreements, we had the, the exit of Egypt. Uh, when we had the, the different accords. At the time, there were no social media, no live coverage or broadcast. What we used to hear before is Jordan first, Syria first. This is what the Egyptians used to say. There was a, a campaign that says that uh, uh, Egypt is first and our Egyptian pharaoh uh, history, and they have departed from this uh, conflict equation. What does it mean? So the cause of Egypt is Sinai in its conflict with Israel. It is Sinai. So since Egypt is first and there is no one cause for all Arab and there is a marginalization of the Arab identity for Egypt. So the first cause is Sinai. So for Egypt, so the conflict started in 1997, 1967. And if they retrieve Sinai, then the conflict is over. So brothers and sisters, it is no coincidence to have prior to that by three days, uh, three years, uh, the recognition of the PLO as the sole representative of the Palestinian people. This is something that uh, the PLO strived for. And the countries that adopted that in Rabat, they wanted to get rid of the Palestinian cause. Uh, they said that there is uh, one uh, representative that would carry out the job. And after that, we had Camp David uh, where Egypt uh, exists this exits this uh, equation so the model entails is to regain territories that had been occupied in 1967 and after that the egyptian israeli conflicts would come to an end uh, and the palestinian cause would be marginalized so this process uh, had been uh, long resisted but it prevailed afterwards uh, so it uh, were, there were attempts to implement that on different fronts, including the Syrian front, uh, and then the adoption of uh, a conflict, uh, which is a Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, and also a peace uh, on the territories that had been colonized or occupied in 1967. So here we have underlined that the Palestinian cause started in 1948 and not 67. And it would be very difficult to say that the conflict between Egypt and Israel started with the Sinai problem. When the conflict started between Egypt and Israel, Sinai was not occupied. So the conflict or the problem uh, uh, was as a result of this conflict between Israel 
and uh, Palestine. So the same applies to Syria. The conflict was ab ab uh, about uh, Palestine. There was no problem or occupation when it comes to the Golan Heights. Uh, so there were a number of military groups that had been sent uh, to fight in Palestine. So when we, when we chose the title of this uh, seminar, which is contemporary relevance, talking about memory and amnesia. So the memory is 1996 It reads, it requires an amnesia of 1948 to talk about an Israelo-Palestinian conflict that means all these conflicts are going to end with peace. So the problem with regard to those who have adopted this uh, model so this is a self-destructive model. So so if uh, Egypt, uh, when Egypt's department, so uh, Israel did not need to give back any territories. So this model can be implemented on any other country, but not on the Palestinians. And when it comes to Jordan, the matter was not a matter of land. So the Palestinians had concluded the Oslo Accord and have regulated the uh, uh, Jordan, so they have uh, concluded a peace deal without uh, any issues with the territories and also uh, they had the issue of refugees uh, and it had not been mentioned in the negotiations with the Israelis. Uh, so the issue of refugees in 1948, that is uh, uh, being repeatedly used as a holy matter uh, for things to do with citizenship uh, in Lebanon, in Jordan, Jordan that has 50% uh, of Palestinians and Palestinians are citizens of Jordan. The same applies to Syria when they sit at the negotiation table, they do not talk about uh, uh, refugees in Lebanon. When we talk about the rights of Palestinians, they scream and they start talking about the right of return and refugees. But when we talk about it, they do not pose these matters in the negotiations with the Israel. What they talk about is the uh, Sheba uh, fields uh, and the uh, farms, sorry. And also when the uh, Syria talks about uh, or negotiates, it talks about the Golden Heights. Uh, in no negotiations between Syria and the Israelis, they never talked about uh, uh, refugees, but the topic of uh, uh, Palestinian refugees, it's never posed for negotiations. So the right of return is an internal kind of matter for internal consumption. And here lies the importance of talking about the contemporary relevance of a Nakba. Yes, when we talk about the contemporary relevance of the Nakba, we talk about refugees after peace, but after the Egyptian Israeli peace and after that the Palestinian Israeli peace, please allow me to do so. This is what is being called. And after the declaration of principles and after the Israeli Jordanian peace and the repeated negotiations between Syria and Israel up until the Syrian revolution and even less than a year before the Syrian revolution. So despite all that, we have repeated, as Dr. Tariq had repeatedly said, we looked into these figures. And what I'm presenting to you here is a summary of the opinion polls that have been carried out. The results are different, but they are similar. So there are similarities in terms of these results. So is the Palestinian issue is a Palestinian issue or only a Palestinian issue? So the samples that have been taken, so it is 22,000. So this is the largest uh, sample that can be thought about in in an opinion poll. So we're talking about 14, 13, 12 Arab countries. So the results that you can see before you, we talk about 77%, uh, uh, 75%. So the opinion polls with regard to the opinion issue or Palestinian cause as being the first cause of the Arabs. Uh, so the Arab Opinion Index poll results since 2011 regarding the trends in Arab public opinion with regard to the recognition of Israel by the respondents, even in Egypt. 
So the results in Egypt are no far away from the results that we have here. So there are some circumstances when we talk about uh, agreements, peace agreements that are signed by governments. Uh, yes. So there is contradiction without recognizing the legitimacy of uh, a colonizing, uh, occupying entity in the region. So, brothers and sisters, uh, we are not talking about uh, democratic states. The, the public opinion is not an active public opinion. It does not impact the elections, but the public opinion at the end of the day can be activated through a number of revolutions, political parties, uh, and uh, it can be also recruited by saying that Palestinians have sold their territories, their lands. We can recruit them by saying we do not want to be Palestinians more than the Palestinians themselves should be. It can be also directed into Arab, Arab or sectarian kind of problem. So these are the figures that we have. These are not active or effective forces, but these are figures uh, that are relevant to the fact uh, whether the acceptance of Israel after all these attempts uh, no, no, it has not entered into the emotions. And when when the Palestinians take to the street, you see the results. So the Palestinian street cannot expect solidarity without strife. So the victims are passive, does not get and attract solidarity. And we have seen in the level of solidarity interaction interaction with the Palestinian cause at the Arab level and worldwide. In these recent incidents that have happened, that have been described not materially, potentially saying that the Palestinian cause is a marginal cause. Dennis has authored two books, and as a human being, as a person, Dennis Ross said, I, so he keeps on playing a consistent role in making the peace deal a failure in Syria and Palestine by trying to represent the Likud in the negotiating team. Dennis Ross, through two books, uh, he said that uh, the that the Palestinian cause is not the main cause of the Arabs. Uh, so we can do this and we can do that. And the Arabs would not pay heed to what is happening. Kushner, after that, and the four other members, they have implemented the theory of Dennis Ross that says that we can move the embassy and we can can push the GCC countries to normalize relations with Israel without anything happening on the ground. So the recent dynamism that we have seen manifest on the ground, we cannot understand it without, without understanding that there is a revolution on what I said. So there is a lack of acceptance of such a matter. So this is rejected by these countries. So people had things hidden that they wanted to express. So they have been repressed. And after that, all this exploded after the revolution, saying that the Palestinian cause does not exist. So there is a mix up, a very problematic, imperialistic, and I intentionally say imperialistic, uh, talking about the matter of state and a regime. They talk about Arab states. What they mean is Arab regimes and not Arab states. Uh, yes, uh, I think that this uh, short period of time where the Palestinian cause had been used in this nationalistic, nationalistic uh, uh, period, uh, so it was not. It was not a nationalistic cause, not even in 1948, as it is manifested in the war itself. But they are wrong when it comes to the Arab peoples. 
and when we talk about the Arab peoples are not being important, they should remember what had happened in 2011 and 2012, in 2019, when we had the second wave of Arab revolutions. And what has happened now is one of those waves, what we have seen uh, in Palestine, is in Palestine, sorry, is one manifestation. And this is similar to what had happened in France in 1789 and uh, continued until 1872. So, and the Palestinian cause is at the heart of all these matters when it comes to the peoples of this uh, region. Let's go back to an Nakba. So, Tariq has taken three quarters of my hour, but I'm going to try, Dr. Tariq, as much as I can to conclude my intervention very quickly because what I had prepared is what I wish to say now. What I have said so far had not been prepared. I was only improvising or ad-libbing what I had said so far. Yes. Yes. Do I have 10, 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Very quickly. There are a number of slides that we can see before us here. We have the UN General Assembly Resolution 181. So the brothers who are from the Palestinian studies are specialized in this field, starting with Walid Al-Khalidi, who is the latest person that had been recruited to this center. You are professors and specialized in the field, your authorities in the field. So talking about the different resolutions that have been undertaken. So facts about the demographic make demographic, sorry, makeup uh, and the, the constant demographic makeups of the uh, country and the number or the total population of Palestine and so on and so forth. So the total population of the Arab state and the Jewish state, all of these things are known to you and the historians, they know these details. So there are so many that have written about this matter about what has happened in Palestine. So you can see before you the total population in historical Palestine. So the Jews constituted 3% and during the Belfort promise. So, so it was not uh, due to the anti-Semitism that used to be in uh, Europe. So many of them have moved to the West. Uh, so the Zionist movement has increased the number of Jews uh, from 3% to 33%. They were given 55% of the land and the rest of the story is known to you. Uh, <coughs> military skirmishes uh, started after the partition resolution. But what I want to remind everybody of is when the military skirmish started after the partition, before the Arab armies entered, that took place by Arab volunteers only. There was an attempt by the United States in April, <coughs> Uh, March uh, 1948 to go back and uh, cancel the partition resolution. Uh, 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 I say this to people who like to focus on this, and rightly so. There was a movement called Ehud. Uh, uh, that under, uh, after the United States withdrew its support for the partition, uh, they said that they should work for a unified state for both Jews and Arabs. So uh, this, this idea of one state solution had support uh, 
both uh, among the left and the liberals at that time. The, the Haganah continued its attack, of course. They started expelling and evicting ethnic, using ethnic cleansing, what we call now ethnic cleansing, before then the Declaration of Independence. The myth, the Zionist myth, that claims that uh, that uh, Arabs were expelled after the Arab armies had entered the fray is not true. The vast majority of Palestinian towns and cities, the population were expelled before, before the Arab armies entered and before the declaration of independence was made. Some some historians talk about uh, the Plan D, and uh, they by that they mean that the Jewish population will. Uh, uh, the, 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 they had this plan D because they had other plans, plan A, 41 and, four, and 43, uh, plan B and then for plan C and for plan D. For plan D was aimed at taking control of Arab towns and cities and expelling their inhabitants. The first operation was called Mahshum. They occupied 37 towns and villages, Palestinian towns and villages. And the, so the beginning of the attack on Jerusalem. You know the Deir Yassin massacre took place before the declaration of independence by Israel and the Arab armies entering. It's always said that the Arab armies entered the battle and we, the Palestinian population had to leave. This expulsion was organized and systematic. And on the 9th of April of 1948, this massacre in Deir Yassin took place before the war has started. There's a lot of focus on the Deir Yassin massacre and about 15 years ago, Tantura massacre was uh, discovered. Uh, there were there was a, a series of massacres, in fact, in, in Palestine, which took place in Palestine, whereby ethnic cleansing has taken place. And the, the idea that the, 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 some people still say and repeat the falsehood that it was the Arab army who asked the Palestinians to leave temporarily only to come back later on. Unfortunately, even some people in the Arab left quarters still believe that. They always used the Zionism, imperialism, and Arab reactionary forces as a uh, trinity for they blamed all the ills on. Even in the assassination of Kamal Jumbulat, the same thing. Uh, Dr. Walid Al Khaldi has written extensively about this. And there nobody has established or could establish that the Arabs asked the Palestinians to to leave. In fact, uh, po civil populations leave war areas. This is normal practice because of the war itself. But the the difference is the Israelis uh, decreed a law decreed a law saying that no uh, no uh, people who, who left can come back because in fact they were killed they were called uh, people who, who like uh, 
uh, smuggled in, through the borders, not as the native inhabitants. So there was forceful uh, expulsion, there was ethnic cleansing, there were the massacres, all these contributed to it. And Jaffa, before independence, suffered uh, Haifa. Most thousand cities, the, they were evicted before the declaration of independence. Adam Raz, an Israeli author, uh, published a book about looting, systematic looting. In fact, people talk about furniture and other stuff. He, he wrote a, an entire book detailing the looting because this colonial uh, uh, settlement is based on the idea of transfer, expel people and take over their homes. Uh, uh, we have Bilal Shalash, a recent uh, uh, Palestinian uh, uh, historian, wrote a book, a two volume book about resistance in Jaffa and how their morale collapsed after the people of Jaffa had left. Uh, also, there are other dates on the in Jaffa and Haifa and other towns. As for the Arab dimension, we, we, we know when King Farouk interfered, his own government uh, objected and uh, we know what Jordan's ambitions at that time of the King Abdullah of uh, in Transjordania. We have some experts with us who can provide details and the ambitions of uh, King Abdullah at that time. The Syrians had problems with Syria. In fact, the inter-Arab conflicts contributed to the wars, but the uh, troops themselves uh, fought gallantly. The number of Arab troops in the war, the slide you're watching now is the unofficial or informal war before war was declared. The number of Arab troops in Palestine is estimated at 7,700. During the war, the numbers have changed to 20,000 to 28, uh, facing Zionist forces uh, ranging between 32,000 to 35,000, and they rose quickly to reach 95,000, and they reached even, they reached 108,000 by December 49. Of course, uh, uh, some fought in the World War and had were experienced fighters. Even by sheer numbers, the Zionist forces uh, uh, outnumbered the Arab forces and they had a unifying command structure and they didn't have problems between them. Of course, uh, the, when Czechoslovakia decided to provide Israel by arms and weapons at a time when other countries were applying an arms embargo has made, meant a lot that uh, many fighters from <coughs> Eastern European countries joined the Israeli forces and uh, Isaac Rabin confirmed this in 1979 when the relations between Israel and the Soviet Union was tense. It's Yitzhak Rabin, 
I was surprised by this fact, in fact, because when you read the Arab historian's account, uh, Rabin is saying without this deal, the Czech arms deal, Israel couldn't have been founded. This was at a time when their relations were tense with them. And Shimon Peres also in his book before his death in 2018, he says without, without, without these supplies, we couldn't have fought the war of independence as they call it. I just want to remind everybody uh, when now we're talking about the importance of the Nakba, the, the question of lid. Uh, Haifa had 80,000, they have, they, they have 3,000. Yafa, 90,000, they have 2,500. <laughs> the, the lid, there was the Dahmash Mosque massacre. They surrounded 176 men inside the mosque and shot them to death. And about 470 civilians outside. So therefore a very few number of the original inhabitants from Lud remained in the city. Uh, I said the conclusions at the beginning, but uh, just to remind everybody about uh, the importance of this topic, the contemporary relevance of the Nakba is important now as it was before. When, when people used to enter negotiations by saying 22% is the maximum you get, 1967 borders, and 22% of Palestine, this is a settlement, this is a compromise. If we take the 1967 as the beginning of the crisis, no Palestinian state can be found on the borders of 1967, on the 4th of June 1967. People from BZ University from 1992, no, some of my articles, some were published in English. One state solution cannot be achieved simply because the two state solution had failed. This is not uh, the right preconditions. You need other conditions. We talk about uh, desires and wishful thinking, but this is not how it's done. And Israel is either a colonial settlement uh, book or an or apartheid country. So do we have to choose between one of them, an apartheid state or a colonial settlement? In apartheid, there was only one case, and that was South Africa. As for the colonial settlement is a concept. Apartheid is just a case, it's not... A, for this reason, we say it's apartheid-like state because there is only one example. But apartheid in South Africa was established by a colonial settlement regime. There is no contradiction between apartheid and colonial settlement as when we should hold the, uh, discussions to establish that. If we want to discuss if this is so or not, I don't know how much time we need to, but I conclude here and I thank you for your kind attention. Dr. Tariq, thank you very much for this uh, Sarah presentation. It's a number of lectures combined into one. 
I'll immediately move to questions for I have so many of them. There are two types. There are some oral questions people pose. They have comments and things. Uh, I'll give them the opportunity to speak. There was another type of questions. People decided to write uh, to us and pose their questions. I'll start with those who want to comment. And I apologize if I mispronounce names. Gito Schapler, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name right. Are you with us? Mrs. Schabler. She's not with us now. Anyway, she raised her hand. I received many comments. They all thank Dr. Azmi and comment his ideas, commend his ideas and agree with him. There are some more detailed questions. There's a question about uh, Egypt's role and how active it can be and uh, a possibility of Egypt playing a role in the Palestinian reconciliation. Another question is about how to use legal instruments inside Israel to face up to Israeli colonial settlement policies. Please, doctor, if you can answer these questions until we receive more. So far as the Egyptian role is concerned and how effective it is, I will not analyze the history of it, especially in the last eight years and their role in 2014. What is fundamentally different was Egypt's role in 2012 in comparison when the Egyptian president was a democratically elected president. It was totally different than Egypt's role in 2012 and Egypt's role in 2014. For this reason, the 2012 war ended very quickly with some achievement. This time round, the Egyptians applied pressure on, on the Israelis to accept some political conditions, but I think the, the, the Palestinian leadership in Gaza uh, maneuvered extensively for the benefit of Egypt in Sinai because Egypt now wants to stabilize its regime and play a bigger role internationally and uh, they want to they want to uh, negotiate and liaise with the leadership in Gaza because Egypt has noticed that it had lost a lot since 2014. I want to allude to something important that the Egyptian media has totally uh, uh, really focused on, the, on Egypt's role in Gaza, totally ignoring what was happening with the Renaissance dam in Ethiopia, the dam was being filled. So Egypt's role was focused on and played much into because they wanted to cover for Egypt's failure on other fronts. Anyway. Uh, 
the authority Gaza welcomes Egypt's uh, intervention because they simply have no other gateway to the outside world. And the entire Egyptian establishment is, although it's a nation state, but, uh, but the Egyptian doctrine, in fact, is Israel is uh, a threat to Egyptian national security. From this angle, Egypt is a proper state, and the public service in Egypt does not see Israel as an ally. They see it as a threat. That's why normalization of Egypt has never succeeded. And this, of course, uh, is compatible with the Egyptian establishments that the relations between Egypt and Israel should not be one of uh, a passionate love affair. They look like it's the case with some countries now which uh, normalize with Israel. As for their role in reconciliation, Palestinian reconciliation, I think uh, time will tell, but uh, There is an American-Israeli desire, and maybe with other countries, because Egypt does not have $500 million to give to Gaza for uh, uh, rebuilding, and it's not coming from Saudi Arabia. So where is it coming from? Egypt's playing a role in Gaza which is much better than other countries. Thought. Maybe there is an American and Israeli encouragement. Uh, they, they, they don't want Egypt to have a clout, but a leverage on the forces in Gaza and West Bank. I think if it wasn't for the misunderstanding between Egypt and uh, uh, President Abbas's adversaries in Fatah and the support by the Emirates to those, the, the, uh, Abbas would not object to a bigger role by Egypt, but, uh, but what stops them is the close relations between Egypt and Ab Abbas's enemies within Fatah. This is solved and the situation will talk. You notice how many times the American president uh, commended the role of Egypt and mentioned Egypt, because this is on the one hand. On the other, they don't want to have direct contacts with Hamas. So at least from what things appear to be now, Egypt's role uh, is welcome. But this is not uh, this is not based on proper analysis, just based on some media reports and my own intuition. There is another thing, and that is resorting to legal instruments inside Israel. This is something confusing for me. I was engaged. This I was a member of the legal and constitutional committee of the Knesset in three sessions. Israel from 1977 is going through an economic liberalization coupled with political liberalization, moving from the Zionist movement to Likud policies was a, a political liberalization. This is something may sound strange, it has benefited the Arab. The Israelis until the 70s used to live in a semi-socialist uh, uh, state, and they were all uh, militarized, they were all prepared, they were all... They did not... The, the Israeli Labour Party 
would not even accept a Zionist as a member. They would not accept the Arabs. The Likud period, this is an irony, the economic liberalization was coupled by political liberalization. This allowed the Arabs to engage more and have a more active civil rights movement and they flourished economically. The Arabs inside Israel were Israelized, we can call it that. They they, their status had risen from mere laborers to contractors or secondary contractors, albeit. So they got rid of the military rule, and the Arabs in '48 started distinguishing themselves from the Arabs in '67 because they have better rights. So the state is a Jewish state uh, as it defines itself uh, and this is what I would like to clarify to my dear brothers and sisters who are following us on social media. It is a Jewish state uh, and the state of the Jews. So it is a state for any Jew who decides to become a citizen and also it is a Jewish state amongst the, the legal experts. Uh, it is a Jewish state as per the uh, legal establishment in its objectives, which is most important, uh, amongst which they had the nationalistic law, which entails that the settlement is uh, amongst the objectives of the supreme objectives of the state. So when you expropriate a land, you say this is an expropriation for public good. When we define public good, it is an ethnic definition. So when we define public uh, good, so how is the judiciary going to be? So how? So if the public good is a Jewish definition, it is an ethnic definition. So if settlements, so they don't call it settlement, they call it lishuv. So settlement, they use a different word for the people of 48. So, but it is a process of settlement. So with all matters to do with territories or a land, it is uh, the law is uh, enacted in order to get those lands from the Arabs. Uh, so if the law does not allow the expropri expropriation of lands, the law would be changed. And there are so many experiences in this regard. So when Arabs, uh, they get a loophole or a way into the law for them to uh, get their lands back. So the Knesset would enact new laws. So the matter of laws in terms of territories and lands, so resorting to the court, you would be surprised. People are never bored of doing that. So at the end of the day, what they're aiming to achieve is the territories and lands. And when it comes to security matters as well, so why do you see me here, not in Palestine? You would never win your case when you have a security case. If they want to say that there is a security case and there is a witness from the security apparatus that would say this or that, and there is a security source, unknown source, his testimony would be accepted in the court. So this is what is called in political science and sometimes they make me really laugh. So they call it securitization. So, so it is called securitization. So I really, really find it funny. So Israel does not want institutes or discussions and so on and so forth. Everything is securitized. So if you want to win a battle against a citizen, just consider it a securitized matter because Israel is a securitized state. 
So in the West, there are securitization of certain cases on matters. And in dictatorships, this is, of course, taken for granted. Every, every matter, every case is considered a securitized case. So in some cases, in my view, when it comes to civil equality, we can have some achievements as far as laws are concerned. And from this standpoint, a number of NGOs and establishments have been established since the beginning of the 70s and the liberalization of the court and the beginning of a phase, which is the statute laws for the freedom of labor and civil rights. So they have established some of those laws and at that particular phase it was possible to achieve results in civil rights but we would like to bring to your attention that there is a counter account from the part of the right elite on the judiciary that tries to topple these achievements and the most important of which is the nationalist law so that we have been working on since the mid 90s when we talked about nationalistic rights and the state of citizens and as a result of that they have established the nationalistic law and that israel is the state of jews and the, the impact on that of laws. So I expect after the participation of Arabs from 48, my own people inside Israel, after they have taken part in the new Intifada, there's going to be a new attack on the rights of the Arabs inside Israel. So there have been a number of gangs, right groups. So I'm going to use here a word. Our brothers inside Israel know it, particularly the Democrat Jews uh, to grom, the word is to grom. I think they tried to implement to grom against Arabs inside Israel. So when there are gangs that are in uh, anti-Semitic in Odessa, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, in the different cities of Ukraine, in Polo, they used to uh, carry out to grom against the Jews. So the last intifada or uprising, they tried to have fascist groups to target them in their own houses, to terrify them. And Israel did not need to do anything because the police was carrying out, uh, carry out such acts. And now the settlers are organizing themselves. And this is a fascist concern and threat. And Netanyahu said that he is going to uh, go back to administrative detention. So you can be detained for up to six months. So the achievements that have been made by Arabs inside Israel as part of their strife in order to achieve a number of civil rights. And I do claim that I played some role in such achievements when I used to live inside Israel. So there are some attempts, and this is one last point that I would like to talk about, the conflict is between the right and the right inside Israel. When there is a conflict between the right and right, uh, as people are uh, very much bewildered by what Macron is doing, so the conflict is between uh, the right and the right in France, who is more against Muslims uh, than the other. So there is a kind of an outbidding amongst these groups in their animosity towards Arabs and as to how and how much they incite against uh, Arabs. Uh, when it comes uh, to international law, I am more skeptical and there are some colleagues that are much more specialized in this field. I do think that international law does not have a, uh, uh, an instrument whereby it is going to be implemented because you would need a power that would implement it if the different powers, great powers, are partial to such kind of laws, it would be implemented. We're talking here about a number of values uh, about which a number of states have gathered and been unified. So give me one example whereby a victor had been uh, 
have had a verdict issued against him. So in the war, so it was the Germans and the Japanese that had been uh, held accountable, had been sued, the verdicts had been issued against them and not the Americans and the Britons. So talking about the ICC, had any victor been uh, issued a, a, a verdict against? Is this going to be if great powers and a balance between these great powers, then it is going to be recognized. But you can achieve theoretical and moral achievements uh, uh, through international law, as it happened with regard to the wall. But you need agencies to stand with you. That is why when it comes to international law, I'm very skeptical. And the same thing applies to the ICC. Our, uh, these crimes are the perpetrators are going to be sued. So these crimes are being carried out in a member state, which is Palestine. I do not know how this is going to happen. So it is a matter that is linked to a balance of power. It is a political matter. When it comes to international law and its relationship with national liberation movement, I have some doubt. At least, at least I have some doubt when it comes to this matter. Thank you very much. I have a number of verbal interventions. I call upon the different persons that would like to take the floor to be brief, because there are written questions that are very long. Mr. Elefendi, go ahead, sir. Microphone, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Tariq. Thank you, Dr. Azmi. My question Dr. Azmi talked about two dynamisms and talked about the normalization of relationships that is happening now. I can hardly hear what the speaker is saying. So, normalization is exiting the Arab-Israeli conflict. But what we have noticed is that that the countries that have normalized relations do not withdraw from the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So this process is based on the conflict itself because there are conflicts, there are threats, Had there, hadn't they been there, the Israel wouldn't have been keen to conclude agreements with Egypt, for instance. So to what extent this is going to continue, this dynamism? So there is another dynamism that has manifested in the recent conflict, which is the dynamism between armed conflict and the strife by the Palestinians and Hamas that is carrying out this conflict or fighting in this conflict on behalf of others. It is clear that in some instances, there is a great deal of support to the international, or to the Palestinian course on an international level and even in the Arab countries. But But when Arab countries feel that there is somebody who is going to stand in this conflict, they do not support. So we can hardly hear the speaker, I'm afraid. So we do apologize to whoever is listening to the translation. Thank you very much. Dr. Abdul Wahab Al Qassab, go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. I have gladly listened to the intervention made by Dr. Azmi Bshara. What uh, attracted my attention is a point that was alluded to by Dr. Azmi, how's the how the balance of power has uh, changed 
all of a sudden between an Arab position that had achieved something and another Arab position that had withdrawn or had been less effective. And this is something that was referred to by some Iraqi military historians and Arab historians who place blame on political leadership that had imposed a truce that was of no need at the time. So in my humble opinion, there was a great problematic because there wasn't much cooperation between three main armies that fought in the Nakba 48. We talk about the Egyptian army, the Jordanian army, and the Iraqi army. We noticed that the Iraqi army covered approximately 70% of the forces. There were a number of commanders heading this military, but the problem lied in, in the army that was uh, headed by club. And from there, we lost areas such as Al-Lid or Lod and Ramla. It is very important to indicate that, that the Iraqi forces should have achieved a victory with the, the Egyptian forces in the area of Ashdud and uh, they should have had some real cooperation, coordination, and this has led to the fact that the Al-Naqab being controlled by the Zionist. Uh, the first truce opened the door for the Eastern European countries to send fighters and weapons. And therefore, there was this offer of a truce with the, the Arab countries. Please be brief, Abdullah. There was a, a Polish uh, uh, brigade wanted to fight with the Arabs. The Arabs refused, and they fought with the Israelis, ultimately. Dr. Huda's right. Uda, are you with us? Yes. I didn't, I don't have a question. Maybe I did something wrong with the computer. Doctor. Yes, thank you. It's always the case we learn something new from Dr. Azmi's lectures. For me, the most important was the crystallization of the idea of uh, committing a mistake in something which has become something, a common understanding of late, and that is terming the struggle because calling the Palestinian cause the Arab-Israeli cause and its origins began in 1967. This is a very dangerous uh, concept and it's evidently clear that it's totally wrong. For me, the question, the pertinent question in my mind and probably in the minds of many other Arab observers, and they probably long to hear it from Dr. Azmi, and that is what is the future prospects for the Palestinian cause. To the extent that we can talk about it clearly, uh, history is being made now under our own eyes. There are always surprises, of course, which make it difficult to forecast. But what is, in your estimation, what does the future hold 
for for the Palestinian cause. Thank you. Thank you. Is uh, and we don't to want to take too much of your time. I will summarize the most uh, important questions, and I'll give some ten minutes or fifteen minutes to Dr. Azmi because it will be impossible to respond to all the questions we have received. We received many questions regarding the role of the outside forces outside Palestine, the Jordanian role, and how to assess it, the role of the European Union, the role of Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Iran, the role of the anti-colonial and Zionist expansion among the Jews. There are also questions pertaining to the future. And does Dr. Azmi think that uh, the peaceful struggle and civil disobedience and the like can affect a change in the balance of power? Is the Palestinian reconciliation a possibility? And if so, has it been enhanced by the latest events? There are other questions on the possible uh, any rapprochement between Iran and the Gulf countries. Will this impact the Palestinian question or not? And uh, someone is also asking Dr. Azmi Bshara to assess and evaluate what happened to the normalization projects between some Arab countries and Israel. Will they have to recalibrate what they've been doing or continue regardless? And also, some want you to speak more about the the relationship between apartheid and colonialist uh, settlement. And I would like to apologize to other people. I'm getting more questions as I'm reading the old ones. If we want to respond them all, it will take us all night. So I'll leave it here. Thank you. The floor is yours, Dr. Azmi. Thank you very much, Dr. Tara. I think the normalization has been mentioned in more than one question. I agree. I, I, I think I, I, could, I was imagining that people in the days of uh, the pandemic uh, have got fed up, have grown fed up from Zoom and these applications and virtual conferences. You know, the mobilizations which have taken place lately are different. I spoke a little bit about uh, the Egypt Israeli normalization when countries engaged in conflict wanted to get out of it as a result of changes in international alliances because Egypt's moving into the Western alliance required Egypt to make peace with Israel. Uh, the Sadat did his best to cover for that, and he used the concept of the PLO being the sole representative of the Palestinians to, as a face saving formula and link it to the Palestinian question. But in summary, this was a condition for him to leave the Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, so far as the Gulf countries are concerned, Sudan was blackmailed, really. And extortion was practiced against it. 
As for the Gulf countries, they were not. They had relations with Israel before the normalization, a kind of alliances they were building. Normally, there will be peace, then a normalization, then alliances. In the case of the Gulf countries, they had alliances before. This culminated in declaring the normalization publicly. So I think we did not, people did not do enough to denounce the previous alliances like the lobbies in Washington and the others. There was a joint common fear by Israel and the Gulf countries from democratic changes and the position vis-a-vis -vis Iran. The situation with Iran, I put it in the second order of priorities. I think the Arab Spring was the number one threat, what they call safeguarding the stability. By that, I mean the stability of their regime post 2011. The Palestinian cause in this kind of normalization is very marginal. When our brothers normalized, they did not do that against the Palestinians as such. When they, when they talk about uh, business, business uh, people making deals which collapse, they say no hard feelings, nothing personal. They just love the other side and they have strategic allies, alliances with Israel because of regional issues and the Palestinian cause is not the cause for us. So in order, in order for them to justify this outrageous campaign against the Palestinians, Palestinian, they, they, because there is a long history of the Arab nation considering the Palestinian cause as its number one cause, so they want to do something to dissuade people from that and turn them away from it. So there is a lot of details regarding the revolution in Egypt, the changes in Bahrain, and the Horn of Africa, Libya. This is a long, long subject, but this is the gist of it. And of course, the position regarding Iran. So therefore, I don't think the Antifada can impact. I don't know, maybe, I don't. But uh, rationally speaking, I don't think it will because it's related to other issues. What is puzzling for Palestinians, however, is if these are your real reasons why this outrageous campaign against Palestinians and why this unreasonable love for Israel, people, when they normalize, they don't resort to this kind of passionate love affairs. As for the Arab support, Dr. Abdul Wahab. I agree with you, in fact, and I want to comment, and this is relating to other questions. Well, so far as there is nothing as uh, if this and if that, and there is no such thing as this is fair or not fair. There are there are people who are less advanced from us, they got their independence. There is no ifs and buts about it. Even in the case of our cause, many countries are involved, and there is nothing unfair about it. But for simple purposes of analysis, there is the overlapping of two complex issues. The is Jewish question and the Arab question. And of course, uh, there is a huge amount of complexity surrounding the Jewish question in the world and how they got, the Europeans got uh, rid of a big uh, cause of headache for them and they exported the Jewish question to us. And also in the Arab question, 
the struggle between different Arab regimes and the lack of unity, and also the relations of Arabs themselves with themselves and with the Palestinian cause. So therefore, we had to undergo what other peoples have not undergone, and I don't think we can achieve victory without rediscovering that and rediscovering our political discourse. You cannot face the world when the colonial power colonizing you is Israel and without you being undemocratic. It's impossible. Our problem is different. Our struggle is different. Our reality is different. You cannot achieve independent as a Palestinian achieve uh, independence if you're not uh, Arabized in your approach and you're a Palestinian chauvinist. We cannot do that. And this view has spread. Also, for example, we cannot at the same time call for justice, freedom, and democracy, and at the same time send the, uh, communications congratulating Bashar al-Assad, for example. Uh, and we cannot also give up on that, give up on 70% of the Syrians. And they say, why aren't we people? Don't we suffer? Why aren't you? Uh, the people of Palestine are not uh, chosen people by God. We are stuck with the, those who call themselves the chosen people. So we have to interact with other people. We have to appreciate that other peoples have their own problems. People pay attention to us in the South because we are the last colonial case remaining. And, and, and if we lose this pathos, anti-colonial, and we will lose everything. We will lose them if we do not sound them. But we are important for the peoples of the South because we represent the last colonial case. If we stop acting as a liberation movement will lose their support. You are right, Dr. Abdullah, when people stand with us and yet we start, after that we have our own problems and we divide them. The rest is known. Also, we cannot respond to the apartheid regime without a democratic discourse. Because the whole world is with them. And every effort against apartheid was based on democracy and democratic rights. And that's why it has really rallied a lot of support. We as Palestinians, since we lost our uh, status as a liberation movement and we replaced that with the PA, Palestinian Authority. Our discourse has changed and the attitude of people towards us. And I uh, agree with what uh, Dr. Abdul Wahab al Qassab and uh, with the first and second truce of 1948. I, I think uh, I was recently reading a book by George Hanna, Mr. George Hanna, about the catastrophe of the first truce. And the analysis agrees with Dr. Abdul Wahab's analysis. But the fact of the matter is there was no strategic coordination. And they remember. You remember the unified command structure of 1967, how good, what good that uh, had done? Of course, armies have their own structures and their own but they don't have the liberation of Palestine as an objective. They, or the 
to deprive the Jews from having their own state. They were countries coming out of the colonial era, and they had a very powerful public opinion pushing them to do something. As for Raja's question for future prospects and future vision, what, or what to do, I don't think this is a theoretical, hypothetical question. Even the famous book by Lenin, What to Do, is, was directed towards a party. If you ask the Fatah, what do somebody in Fatah should respond? You ask Hamas, what Hamas should answer? Otherwise, who does what? I, I am asked often, I don't have a political party now. Before I had, I am a researcher, I'm a writer now. When you say uh, what to do, who is the human agent in this? For example, if we want to know what Hamas will do, then Hamas can respond. The PLO, the PLO. Without uh, a human agency, it's uh, useless to us. So therefore, I uh, divide my answer into two parts. The Palestinian level, there should be a unified Palestinian leadership. Is this possible? This is the same question about uh, uh, reconciliation. In my opinion, this is not this this is not possible because two authorities cannot reconcile. They are not uh, the, the the word authority means to influence your. So you have men and uh, uh, security forces. Uh, civil services, you see how Arab countries cannot be united. This is impossible. So what is possible, in my opinion, is only to establish a, a, the, the PLO is that finished. They should establish a new entity that uh, the two authorities, Hamas and the PA, accept an overall command, which is about them both, and for example, how Mahmoud, the president Mahmoud Abbas, how he thinks that what he understands by unifying that, he says that he should rule Gaza. And this is not possible. The only possible solution is through partnership. The main uh, obstacle is to have a joint authority where decision taking processes are done jointly. The main obstacle that is how to unify the security forces. I think that is the main thing. Everything else is marginal. It's, they can go to Cairo, they can go here and there. Who will have the monopoly over using violence? Can Hamas accept that Abu Mazen can do that and he can throw them in jail any minute or Hamas does that and at any time they can do what they like with their opponents. They should be convinced both sides that this is can only be done on the basis of a partnership, not one authority. A, a legal personality which is also uh, uh, joined by the Palestinians in the diaspora, uh, pe Palestinian people in the Nakba areas. This uh, uh, entity was killed on purpose after the Oslo Accord. And when the PI lost elections, they revived the PLO partially only because they lost the election. This is the only possibility. When do that, then we can pose the question, what can be done or what to do? We cannot just go to the Palestinian people and ask them what to do when there are, in reality, there are two authorities totally separate and in competition with each other. Is there one single Palestinian decision taken since 2007, which did not involve this competition between the PA and Hamas. 
was this it wasn't this a feature of what was happening in the recent events wasn't the struggle between the two parties present yes it had to be i tell you since this power struggle has entered the fray has become a main consideration so last but not least if if this does not happen what can we do and people many palestinian youth ask me what can we there is no appeal you know that many people are trying to play a role academia organization etc etc in my opinion we can impose as a reality that each palestinian group from its own standpoint or position to join the battle from the place or the position where they are where the trench they are dug in like the settlement on the west bank settlement in uh, jerusalem the palestinian identity uh, in the diaspora like for example amongst the third and fourth generation of palestinians in the diaspora uh, you saw how important um, this is in the social media and the western media the question of identity is an existential question they that they, they, for them they want their identity self-searching searching for a meaning for their lives these are basic and fundamental questions we can face up to zionism on all these fronts and keep the palestinian cause alive and well at present very strongly and sometimes when you look at the youth who who went to interact with the with the people who own the houses or homes in Sheikh Jarrah, they do not represent Hamas or any faction. They are searching for a meaning for their own existence, their own identity. They cannot tolerate. The, some came from Jerusalem, some came from Israel proper, 1948 areas. And people at the Damascus Gate, they did not accept this. This can be organized better, and this can be organized better, I think the future uh, the, the horizons uh, there's something is looming there and these forces uh, uh, are looking for someone who to organize them and i call upon all the think tanks and palestinian academicians they have a role to play i think dr park i don't think we have any time left for everything else yes i think we have to conclude but dr elias khalil has a final comment please be brief thank you i i'm not uh, making a comment i have a question dr azmi you said that the arab question and the jewish question overlap there is another aspect and that is the geopolitical one and the ascendance of china as we know the zionist movement since its establishment and how it grew and flourished under the british mandate regime used to play a functional role on behalf of the colony western colonial powers now the most important thing for the us is the rise of china and this is what trump's cause for concern was do you think israel will continue now with a new function with the china's ascendance it has played a role in the cold war and what followed against the islamic powers with china's ascendance will this be a hindrance to the american approach or will will it play a more active role in this uh, face of between the united states and china we will try dr 
I said what uh, distinguishes it. Every case has a geopolitical aspect. Every national movement, I said what distinguishes us is this overlap between the Arab course and the, the, the Arab question and the Jewish question. This is something peculiar to us, the overlap between the two. I think Israel realizes more than us. Of course, I'm not uh, 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 saying what uh, Palestinian relations with China can be summarized in the kind words uh, Abu Mazen has said uh, to the Chinese Communist Party. The issue is more complex and there are more assets, of course, and uh, lately we received delegates from the, uh, Ch the Chinese uh, Central Committee of the, the Communist Party. We received visits from them. They don't talk about politics, they only talk about uh, economics and they talk about Israel and the potential in Israel for investments also when they go there. Also, we have not uh, heard this from them directly, but from some experts, and this can apply to Russia too. For these people, the case or the issue of Palestine as a national movement uh, cause was there, and it had its role in their political ideology, and maybe still present to a certain extent. Uh, they talk about uh, the relationships of China with the national liberation movement. When you talk about the Palestinian cause as a religious cause, you will lose China, Russia, and India, probably the three biggest countries in the world. So therefore, uh, we must pay more attention to this. Even our brothers in the Islamist movements, they should be aware of this. Because these are superpowers who are on our side. Public opinion, I'm sure, at least, was on our side. And I, I remember opinion polls in the Gaza War in 2014 in China. They're not with us. Maybe people do not pay attention to this. Therefore, this is an important issue to have good relations with these countries. Maybe you know that there was tension in the American-Israeli relations because of awarding the Haifa port contract to a Chinese and also the Huawei company. And the Minister of Defense, Secretary of Defense, came specifically to Israel to stop that because America is, is trying to diversify its relations and because Israel is going to say that we are a superpower in IT and we can open up to China and Russia, they are diversifying the Israelis they have enough self-confidence to diversify and even outmaneuver the United States, up to a certain extent, of course. They cannot say stop to America, but they have room for maneuver with the Congress and their lobbies. This is important in the long run. And China played a positive role in this latest uh, escalation. Now I really mean it when I say thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, rich presentation. You reminded us of the basics, even with a new language, a new discourse, a new analytical tool. You open the windows to the future, and I think we have more contemplation, more dialogue with you, hopefully, also through what the Arab Center produces. We hope that we will meet again in the future. 
It is always a pleasure and I'm happy to see all these very dear friends, some I haven't seen for some time. And now we thank you and we thank the Arab Center, of course. Your research center has done wonderful work. Thank you very much, all of you, ladies and gentlemen. And for your perseverance, we have taken a bit more of your time, but uh, we owe Azmi Bshara a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs>